Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Poultry Keepers 360 Live. It, it, you know, gosh, we've been gone for uh, a month without talking to y'all. It's, it's kind of old home week, oh, family reunion time. Good to be back and glad to have you join us tonight. It's going to be a fun show. We're going to be talking about feed. Um, and coming up, we're going to get right into it. Tonight, we thought it would be kind of a good thing, and we've had some requests for this, to talk about feed ingredients and what they're used for, what they do. So that's the title of tonight's show, you know, hey, what's this in my feed and what does it do? So Jeff is going to carry most of the load for that tonight. Uh, he's got a great presentation tonight, as always. So Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you, and Karen and I, we'll just kind of help Fill in and add fluff to your stuff. Perfect. All right. So I named it <clears throat> the whys and what fours of your feed. Uh, we're going to talk about looking at feed tags, what you see on a feed tag, um, kind of what the generic terms and so on are. And then we'll look at the different grains and what they actually are used for in you know, in the feed. So I, I kind of give you the, the 10,000 foot view of what, what feeds are about. So, all right, Karen. So the why's and what for feed, <clears throat> when you're looking at your feed tag, you know, the big manufacturers and I don't need to name names. You can go, you, you'll see it for yourself. All right. So when you're reading tags and this is really frustrating for me, is you see code names like processed grain products. You see processed protein products, processed grain byproducts, processed protein byproducts, right? So those are in there. The reason they do that is, <clears throat> you know, today if corn is cheaper than wheat, they're going to put in more corn. And tomorrow if barley is cheaper than corn, they're going to use more barley, right? So it allows them to change the ingredients every day or whenever they want to and they don't have to tell you what they changed right mm -hmm. and you've been raising chickens long enough you've opened up bags and say oh this don't look the same as it did you know three weeks ago or a month ago or the last time i bought feed um <clears throat> they're doing it to reduce cost hold costs down increase their profit mm -hmm. you know or if there's a poor lack of availability for a certain grain, you know, it allows them to do substitutions, right? But there, it's a broad term. So you don't know what's in that processed grain product. It could be corn, oat, wheat, barley, could be all of them. It may only be one of them and you don't know which one it is. And they're not going to tell you. So <clears throat> Jeff. Yeah. And, and maybe I'm wrong for thinking this way, but when I see these things on the feed tag, like, processed grain products or grain byproducts or protein byproducts. To me, I, I kind of view that as a red flag that that's maybe not as good a quality of feed as I need to be looking for. Am, am I wrong for thinking that way? Uh, you know, I wish everybody felt that way. And, and here's the thing, you don't know for sure, right? So again, it's a code name, right? It's, it's a top secret insiders only, you know, um, you, you don't know what they're using, right? So whether it's Neutrino by Cargo, whether it's Purina, whether it's, you know, doesn't matter, right? They're all, they all play the same game. Mm -hmm. And as the commodity market changes, so does those ingredients. And, <clears throat> you know, in, in later slides, we'll kind of, you know, show which ones are the byproducts, where, where they fall into and things like that. So what I really like, what I hope, after tonight folks are going to go look at is when you see a tag that says you know corn wheat barley oats you know it's actually naming out the ingredients for you right those feed manufacturers can't change that formula without changing that tag so they're kind of locked into a specific formula which is really awesome for you because you find a feed that you like and, and the label says, this is what's on it. 
it's always going to be there. The other thing that's nice about that is it, it, so feeds have to be listed by in descending order. So the largest input in that feed is always first, the second largest, second, et cetera, right down the line. So it kind of can tell us, you know, it can tell me <clears throat> what the percentage, you know, I can kind of figure out what the percentage of corn is in there or what the percentage of soybean meal is in there or it, so on. And, you know, eventually if you keep listening to this show and meet Blab on, you're going to know how to be able to tell that too, because you know, we're, we're going to cover it someday. But <clears throat> feed tags are really important. You know, I, I'm a label reader no matter where I go, whether it's the grocery store, the feed store, it doesn't matter. I, I'm a label reader and um, it's important to me and I want to know. So, You know, and, and excuse me for butting in here, but I just can't help myself. When I see those terms like corn, wheat, barley, oats, soybeans, whatever in there, that tells me that I'm getting a fairly consistent feed. And, and I can tell if they're starting to change the formulation. Um, you know, it used to drive me absolutely nuts when they would change a formula on the feed. I, I mean, sometimes, not always, but sometimes I could see it. I could smell it. Um, I've even been known to taste it. Yeah, I'm that screwy. But, um, you know, <laughs> this, this is something I look for every time that I'm seeing what the ingredients are. Uh, Rip, you're not screwy for tasting feed. I taste feed everywhere I go. Every time I go on to a farm or a feed mill or whatever, you know, I'm testing and tasting and, you know, look, people, it, it, pick it up, taste it. If it doesn't taste good to you, why are you feeding it? So, all right, sorry, I'm going to get off my high horse, Karen. We can go no, to the next slide. That, that, that's all right, but that, you can also tell if the feed is fresh if you taste it. Well, and there's nothing in there that's going to hurt you. Right. No. There's absolutely. Well, we hope there's nothing in there that's going to hurt you. So, you know, if you get sick from tasting your chicken feed, then we got a problem. So well, I'm, I'm not talking about eating a bowl full for breakfast or anything. Uh, not. Yeah. Hey, a really good chicken feed. I wouldn't mind taking it in the house, mm -hmm. adding a little hot water to it, make me a little chicken feed oatmeal. And and, you know, that's that's what it should be. That's what it should be like. So. I'm not, eat, I'm not eating no raw corn. Why? Wow. You don't eat Alf, sweet corn. You Alf, don't eat Alf, alfalfa meal. Yes, they cook. I eat sweet corn after they cook it. I know that's uh, weird, but yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do right. you eat grits? No. I don't well, know they're anything. cooked. So yeah. there you go. <laughs> anyway, yeah. You want to move on to the next slide? I yeah, think it's a good idea. She got it up there. Go for it. Uh, all right. So what's on a feed tag? You have to have, right? So the top of the feed tag has to say, like the, it doesn't have to say the company's name, but usually it'll be the brand name and your title. <clears throat> but it has to clearly state what type of animal it's for and what class. So like chick starter, chick grower, layer, Etc. Right. So that's that has to be at the top. You've all seen that. Um, if you see a generic term, that should be a red flag for you. If it's not there, so a lot of people share with me the tags that they're feeding. Right. They'll they'll message me, email me, whatever. Say, what do you think of this feed? Right. You see it all the time on poultry breeder nutrition or poultry keepers yeah. three sixty. And, you know, I tell them what I see. I don't hold back. I don't sugarcoat it. So if you're a sensitive person, don't ask me that question because I'm going to be blunt. Okay. So <clears throat> these things have to be on the tag. And then you have the guaranteed analysis comes next. Right. Now, if there's a medication, a medication declaration has to be in there, supposed to be in there between what type of feed it is and the guarantee. So it should be highlighted if it's medicated. So then you go on to the guaranteed analysis, right? And the guaranteed analysis, you know, these are the levels that are supposed to be in there. You need to read the little fine print that says minimum and maximum. But for a poultry tag in the United States, what is legal is you have to have protein minimum. You have to have the fat minimum. You have to have the fiber maximum, okay? 
Um, you got to have the lysine minimum. You have to have the methionine minimum. You're going to have to have the calcium both minimum and maximum. <clears throat> you have to have the phosphorus minimum. Salt minimum and maximum because too much salt in, in a poultry diet is a bad thing. And you'll have to have sodium minimum and maximum. And I forgot to put the maximum in there, but you, the sodium has to be. These are required by law. You know, there's a group of people out there that says you have to do this, right? This is what you have to put in on your label. And they kind of control all of us in the feed industry. So then down below that <clears throat> is going to be your ingredient listing. Again, there's some generic terms that can be used, but not typically... Uh, like we said on the previous slide, you know, are you going to see processed grain products, processed grain byproducts, et cetera. But, <clears throat> you know, we talked about that a little bit, but the ingredients are listed in descending order from largest to smallest. If the, la if the label was made correctly, I see a lot of labels that are not in accordance with the laws that we have to follow, you know, and, and you may run into some of those too. Now, I would not encourage you to run up to the feed mill manager and say, this label's not right. This label's not right. Right. They're probably going to ban you from the store. Right. And, or, you know, label you a heretic behind your back. So just don't do that. Just know that it's not, but if they can't label their feed correctly, what's the chances that they could make their feed correctly. Okay. So just kind of ponder on that a little while. And at the bottom, <clears throat> every bag has to say, who the manufacturer or the guarantor is for that feat, right? Including their address, not a complete address. It's supposed to be a mailing address, you know, so it'll be like post office, box town, et cetera. That's, these are the requirements for a feed label. That's, you know, that's pretty cut and dry. And, you know, is there any questions coming in so far, Karen? I haven't been watching. No, so. Not really. I have a question okay. though. That's fine. Go ahead. Um, so you said the United States, right? I feel like I see that there's a lot less on a Canadian feed tag. Is that oh, it's horrible up there. Yeah, we don't even, for our Canadian friends listening, I feel sorry for you, but they don't have to list hardly anything. They, they have a much shorter list of guarantees. Amino acids aren't on there. They don't have to put their ingredients on there. They're supposed to make them available by request, but we've had... <clears throat> probably a dozen, you know, followers of BK360 and other places that have requested it and they don't get it, right? They yeah, just kind of get, yeah, they just get blown off and ignored and it's not, <clears throat> yeah, that's a whole other, you know, and then when you get to Mexico, it's another world. And when you get to the Philippine tags, it's a whole other world. It's like, you know, every place is different, but, you know, I can talk what is required here in the u.s because i have to live by those laws you know here at for so, all right so I, one more question okay. is there any size uh of a, of a operation that gets labeled like this so here's my example there's been more than one person who has asked me to m make feed for them and sell it to them and i've <laughs> always said no now I have an even bigger reason to say no, right? Because I would have to have a label that has all that nonsense on it. If you're a business that sells feed or animal supplements or something like that, right? So, <clears throat> you know, like Mule City Feeds in your neck of the woods or something like that. And they seem to be great people, so I'm not picking on them. Don't. Yeah. But so they're they're registered with the State Department of Ag, right? Right. And any state, and we have to register in any state that we sell into. Okay. So every state that I sell any of my animal nutrition products, I have to register with that state and I have to pay what they call tonnage fees. So based on the number of tons that I sell, I have to pay them a tax. Okay. People don't, people don't know this now <clears throat> for you as the farmer wanting to help out a friend if you chose to do that, which I know you won't, so <laughs> nobody ask her, but <clears throat> you, you can't, right? It, it, right. There's no, you don't have to abide by that. You're not selling it. Okay. You're, you're mixing you know, it. <laughs> right. Right. And you know what? And, and Karen, if you came to me and said, Jeff, I want you to make this custom mineral mix for my chickens, right? Yep. 
So that's fine. We talk about what it is. You write a letter that I keep on file that says you requested this custom mineral mix. On a custom feed or mineral mix, I do not, you, I do not have to put a guaranteed analysis on it or an ingredient list. It can say custom mix, you know, for Apex Poultry Farm, you know, period. It still has to have who made it down at the bottom, but at the top, when it says custom and I have a letter on file that says you requested that custom, then I no longer have to follow those guidelines. So for people who are getting a custom feed, <clears throat> there's not a requirement for them to put a guaranteed analysis or a list of ingredients on that. But you should have already, that's the whole purpose of the letter on file, right? You, you sat down and worked it out. I want these ingredients. I want it made to this specification. This is what I want. You know, and, and so you already you already have that relationship. You already know what's in there. Um, but yeah, and, and if you are getting a custom mix made by somebody, you can always request what's the analysis of it, right? What 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 are you using? What's I mean, you're in control. It's your custom mix, yeah. but not so much for over the counter feeds. I just feel like so many people are thinking that they've found the perfect small little tiny niche producer that's making feet you know what i mean then then they don't get this information but maybe that's okay because they're working together with them to create right. the diet <clears throat> yeah i i got lots of people that go to the local farmer down the road who has his own grinder mixer there's still a few of these out there right and you know they'll take the supplements they take the formula and you know the old farmer is more than happy to help them out mix custom mix for them you know they drive home with their feet and that's that's awesome when that happens right and everybody's happy but it's few and far between you know it's less than one percent um everybody likes convenience you know we drive down to tractor supply we pick up our bag of whatever and you know off we go and you know people don't check dates people don't read labels people just oh hey there's four layer feeds here on the shelf which one's cheapest and that's what they get and they go Okay. And, and I'm not picking on anybody out there. I'm just saying, this is what I hear almost every day of my life here at, you know, talking to chicken people. So our, our people would go to the store and say, which one's the most expensive. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but that's not necessarily the best either. So yep. I just want to point out that Melissa says I'm wrong, that she tastes her horse feed and that's very effective. And she's going to start eating her uh, chicken feed any day now. All right. If you know the ingredients and you know where it come from, right? And but look, even if you don't know all those things, there's nothing wrong with taking a tongue full of chicken feed. There's nothing in there that should hurt you. And you know, if it doesn't if, if it doesn't taste good and appealing or fresh and you know, then you know, I don't know why are we doing it. But all right. All right. Are we on the next tag yet? Or the next yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. So <clears throat> I find that talking with a lot of folks, you know, and helping them with their feed, um, a lot of folks don't understand why different ingredients are used. Okay. What are they actually in there for? Um, or, you know, everybody knows the common stuff pretty much, but they don't know, you know, beyond that. So in a commercial feed, when you see processed grain products that could include corn, wheat, barley, oats, my milo, sorghum, which is green sorghum, rye, triticale. <clears throat> so those, those that I just rattled off, those are all energy feeds, okay? Those are all starches for carbohydrates to get the energy level to the desired level, okay? And I'll, I have a chart, both, you know, later on, we'll break it down, I'll go into more detail. <clears throat> Your processed protein products are going to be Almost always is going to be soybean meal, solvent extracted soybean meal. That is the most heavily traded protein source out there. Um, depending on where you live and what the availability is, could be corn gluten meal, which is 60% protein, uh, corn gluten feed, which is only 20% protein, um, corn distillers, dried, dis dried distillers grain, sometimes it's called. You're going to see that on a lot of labels, and those are coming from the ethanol plants. I'm not a big fan. Um, further north and west you go, you're going to see peas, 
uh, canola meal. You get down into Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, you're going to see cottonseed meal. <clears throat> cotton is not a good chicken feed. You don't want cotton in there. Um, peanut meal, pretty readily used. <clears throat> now, sunflower meal is showing up all over the place. There's a little bit of a shortage right now. But proteins can be made pretty much from any of the oil seeds. You know, even linseed, which is flax. You know, anything that they're pressing the oil out of. But when you see meal, all right, they've pressed the oil out of it. So believe it or not, okay, people don't understand this. They don't, they can't wrap their head around it. The, the meal that goes into our animal feeds is the byproduct, okay? They are pressing oil seed because they want the oil. There's a higher value in oil than there is in the residual meal. So for a hundred years, during the industrial revolution in the United States, and, and we started pressing oil seeds and doing things like this, but they've been looking for ways to use byproducts from other industries to, and they, they always push it off on agriculture, whether it's for fertilizer, whether it's for animal feed, whatever, right? So we've been stuck with the byproducts and the leftovers for close to a hundred years, right? So, it, it, you know, the industrial revolution was what, thirties, forties, somewhere in there, Rip, you were around those days, weren't you? Oh, I'm just teasing, I'm just teasing, I'm just teasing. So, I feel like anyway. it. Yeah, so, you know, since that time frame, they've been looking for places to go with byproducts and they, they've been running the experiment, right? They feed a little bit of this, they feed a little bit of that to the animals, see if they die, see how well they perform and see if they can figure out how to fix them so the animal can actually utilize them. So just know that going into it, you know, when you see the word meal, um, it's a byproduct, you know, where oil has been removed or something's been removed um so like corn gluten meal is when they pull off the corn syrup you know for cooking and sweeteners and so everything's every you know all the meals are a byproduct so we move on to processed grain byproducts right so what does that word actually mean well most of the time it's wheat middlings so when they mill wheat for flour to make white flour not whole wheat flour um, there's outer skin layers on the wheat, you know, the outer shell that comes off and those are known as the wheat middlings. Okay. Um, same thing happens with soybeans. So when they're making soybean meal, you know, to press the oil, uh, when they do that first crack and roll, uh, the outer skin of the soybean will fly off and they collect that and it goes into the feed stream, uh, primarily as a filler and a fiber, um, Depending on where you live and if they have access to it, there's a product called bakery waste or bakery meal. And bakery meal is unsold, mispackaged, overrun, outdated bakery products. Okay. Could be Little Debbie cakes. It could be loaves of bread that didn't get sold. It could be anything that falls under the category of bakery. And they'll bring that back and they grind it up, they process it, and they turn it into a meal. Uh, they don't always remove the packaging, just so you know. Um, okay. If you look really close, you'll see little pieces of plastic in there and, and whatnot. Um, wheat bran, so the wheat middling is the outer layer. The wheat bran is like the second layer, closer to the heart of the wheat berry. Um, some places you'll find that if it's been separated out. You know, and there's other byproducts out there. Like I said, the most common is wheat middlings. Um, it's cheap. It's easy. You know, it, it, it's, you know, it's been widely used. It's a very inexpensive filler. It looks good on paper. And for all of you who are in love with pellets, you have to have wheat middlings to make a good hard pellet. So the harder the pellet, the more wheat middlings that are in it. Okay. Just, again, I don't sugarcoat it much. That's the bare bones truth of how you make a pellet. So, Jeff, I've got a question that's 
kind of related, but kind of not. But I, while we're talking about grains, this is probably uh, coming up in some people's minds. And that's what what grain can be substituted for what? And, and I'll explain what I'm talking about. Breeders of white skinned birds like Orpingtons, Old English Games, Morons, uh, are afraid to use corn because they don't want to turn the skin or the legs of the shanks or, or anything yellow. And, and so there is an aversion to feeding corn in the diet. Now, if they wanted to go out and make, say, a, a scratch feed, what could they use to replace corn in that scratch feed mix? And I'm, yeah, I'm using that because it's probably the most common thing folks associate with. Uh, you know, wheat's fine. Um, you know, Milo, grain sorghum's fine. You're not going to get the pigmentation. There's no yellowing in that. Um, you know, we can make a combination of wheat, Milo, and barley. Uh, wheat, Milo, and oats. Um, depending on where you live, if you're down in Louisiana or Texas where they grow a bunch of rice, you know, we can use rice as part of that. Um, yeah, it, it, right. It's not hard at all to make a scratch grain or to make a feed around that without the yellowing factor of corn. And I think if you keep the, so just for the listener's sake, and I'm going to throw this out here. So, you, you know, too, Rip is I would tell you that there's corn is probably 40 to 50% of every chicken commercial chicken diet out there. Okay. Because it's the cheapest grain to put in there. Yep. Okay. Right? So they're going to balance that amount of corn. Then they're going to put in there at least three to 400 pounds of wheat middlings. You're probably looking at about 800 pounds of corn, 400 pounds of wheat middlings, about 400 pounds of soybean meal. Right. And then they're going to fill it up with, you know, fluffy big word type stuff. Just uh, you feel like you're getting more for your dollar. But, you know, that's that's going to be so it's going to be eight to nine hundred pounds of corn. You know, and then four to five hundred pounds of wheat middlings, you know, depending on what protein level you're after, then the soybean meal may be anywhere from four to six hundred. Um, <clears throat> it's not, you know, when you do something long enough, you can you can kind of reverse engineer a feed tag and know what what levels the ingredients are going to be in. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, I, I lay awake at night thinking about wonder what kind of crap they're putting in that feed today. So I, and I, I shouldn't be that way, but you know, when you're passionate about something, that's what you do. So yeah. could we talk about oats for a minute? Uh, yeah. Is there a desired form of oats to give to chickens? I, I know you can get whole oats, you can get clipped oats, you can get crimped oats. <laughs> Yeah, you can get oat groats, naked oats, clipped oats, you know, steel cut oats, you can get whole oats, you can get jockey oats, you can get Swedish oats, you can get Canadian oats. I mean, yeah, people just get carried away. Look, I'm just looking for, you know, in my formulas, I'm just looking for a plain old whole oat. It doesn't have to be jockey oats. It doesn't have to be. But, you know, a lot of times all you can get are what they call horse oats, which are a little bit more plump. All right. And they're a little bit more expensive. You know, if you're not in a grain region where you can go find these things, you know, you're kind of stuck buying it at, at tractor supply or, you know, wherever I'm not picking on tractor supply. Um, Horse oats is the only thing I found down here. Yeah, that's fine. I don't, you know, it don't matter. I mean, there's not a big difference. You know, the horse oats have been screened and graded. So you're getting these big fat plump oats and they look really pretty. Um, you know, a little bit easier for the horses to pick up, you know, uh, again, you know, the, the industry is kind of marketing to a specific species to make them feel special. So, and if we have horse listeners tonight, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on your toes, but you know, there's the truth of it. Um, and, and, and for all our breeders of white skinned birds, there are some, are some alternatives out there. So you, you know, you don't yeah. have to mess up your birds by feeding them corn. But you're not going to get it from a commercial feed, right? Look, a no. commercial feed is so locked into corn, right? They, they don't have a choice. I mean, you know, um, corn is king. It just, it's, 
that's everywhere. It's easy. It's cheap. Um, you well, know, and to it, be fair, there's corn in all of my stuff. I mean, my holder diet is 35% corn. So, I mean, even when you're mixing your own, you're still using a whole lot of corn unless you're instructed to not. Yeah. <laughs> Right. But, and that's not yeah. a lot of corn. You know, I, I see diets roll in front of me that are 70% corn, Karen. Mm. Yeah. You know, uh, I mean, the real bare minimum <clears throat> bottom of the barrel type feeds is going to be 1,450 pounds of corn, you know, 450 pounds of soybean meal. Then you start putting in your minerals and your vitamins and stuff like that and your little additives. That's all that's in there, corn and soybean meal, right? And there's no... You know, there's no room for anything else. And yeah, no, yours is 35% is a wonderful number. Well, so. that's just a, that's the, I would say that's the highest percentage of corn that I have. So, um, so, but easier to replace. So if you want a corn free food, it is healthier and easier to do and still have a healthy chicken than it is a soy free feed. It sounds like, yeah. What's that? I said, so, uh, Corn-free feed would be healthier and easier to accomplish than a soy-free feed would. So It's easier to accomplish. You know, I, I don't feel the need to be necessarily corn-free, but, you know, people do, and that's fine. I kind of, I like to work with what the region of the country grows the best and try and utilize those grains when I can. But, you know, if you want to, if you're selling eggs for table <laughs> eggs and you need good yolk color, you're going to be dependent on corn and alfalfa meal, things like that. So it's, there's no real way around it, but. <clears throat> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to laugh there, but I, when you said what grows the best in your region and down here, that would have to be golf courses. Yeah. So, yeah. Kudzu. Can you use kudzu? So we don't have kudzu in Florida or not in my part of Florida. That's strange. It hasn't got that far South yet, huh? Never has. All huh. over Georgia. Just give it time. It'll show okay. up. You, you say, I, I, just a little side funny note here. I used to get the Georgia Market Bulletin, and uh, they would have a little question and answer section in there. And this person wrote in and said they wanted some kudzu in the yard because they thought it was pretty. And, and how could they get it? And the extension agent's reply was, wait two days. <laughs> <laughs> That's how I felt in Georgia. Yeah. Yeah. Just a matter of time. All right. I think we're done on that slide unless we got questions. Right. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so as I promised earlier, I, I put like all the energy grains on one slide for you so you can easily see how they compare. So look, I didn't put all the nutrients on there. You know, look, I, I'm tracking somewhere close to 60 different nutrient levels. Um, when I put together a feed formula, these are kind of like the most critical. Okay. So it's just for your understanding, but you know, barley, for instance, going to be anywhere from 10 to 12 protein. And it's going to be low fat. It's like 1.92%, um, fiber typical. These are national averages. Okay. You, you may be in a place where this is completely different and that's fine. These are just national average numbers that we use. You know, um, there's actually international numbers that I use. <clears throat> Fiber level at five, energy. This is measured in kilocalories per pound. So anybody that's gotten a ration from me, you'll see an energy calculation. Um, so <clears throat> we have to add all these up based on the pounds used, et cetera. So you got your calcium, you got your phosphorus. I had to abbreviate phosphorus. Otherwise, I couldn't get all this on one slide. Um, <clears throat> lysine, methionine, you know, for the, for the dedicated listeners, I've beat this horse to death, right? There's just, I've talked about lysine and methionine forever. So you look at corn, it doesn't matter whether it's cracked or, or whether it starts out as whole corn that's ground. Um, national average, we're looking at 8%, three and a half fat, 2.9 fiber, um, <clears throat> Good energy, really high energy because it's got a huge amount of starch in it. Um, and with the low fiber, you know, so fiber, fiber, comp in a, a fiber affects the energy because <clears throat> when we look at oats uh, later on, you know, you'll see a way lower energy. 
So as the fiber goes up, the energy goes down. And you can kind of see that in the rice down there. Um, rice should be a higher energy, but <clears throat> rice actually with that fiber at 10% is it, it knocks it down again. So, you know, corn's 1500, almost no minerals, right? 0 0.01 on calcium, 0 0.25 on phosphorus. These are not helping, right? These are actually hurting the diet, if you will. So, <clears throat> um, like it, in pretty much every poultry diet, I'm looking for a phosphorus at least I like 0.75. I'm lucky to see a 0.6 or a 0.65 in phosphorus, right? Um, again, looking for lysine levels at close to 1%. These are 0.22. So you can see they're not helping the diets whatsoever. Um, <clears throat> corn doesn't have a lot of lysine, doesn't have a lot of methionine. You know, it's, it's only there for the energy, right? Just only there for the energy. And so millet, a little bit better on protein, um, not a lot of millet grown. You know, you got to be kind of in that Kansas, Colorado area. Um, it's it's not, you know, we don't make a lot of millet. And most of the millet that is, you know, grown is going into like wild bird seed or specialty feeds. So it's rare to see millet show up in a chicken feed, but it's out there. You live in the Midwest or in the South, uh, grain sorghum known as Milo, <clears throat> you know, it'll run uh, 10 to 11% protein. Uh, the higher yielding is going to be seven and a half. Again, I'm using national averages. Um, fat level 2.8, <clears throat> fiber 2. Uh, it's the best replacement for corn, actually, as far as energy goes, because it has a really good starch. So it's at around 4 1,500. Uh, birds really like it. <clears throat> Got a little bit better mineral profile, but the amino acid profile is, is worse. So again, everything on here is only for... <clears throat> it all goes into the pot as far as calculation goes, but these are the primary ingredients that we look to for our energy, to achieve the required amount of energy. That's purely what they're in here for. I've had people contact me and say, hey, I'm going to increase my corn. Um, is that going to hurt my protein? Well, yeah, it's actually going to drag your protein down. Um, but people, I've had people who think that corn will increase the protein and uh, mess a chicken up. So it's not. But <laughs> the energy is what makes them stop eating, though, right? Right. Yeah. So that's... So, uh, According to some studies and university data, we are told that, that chickens eat for their energy needs. And I think this is true of probably 95% of all chickens, right? When they hit a certain calorie count, they're no longer interested in eating. I think that there's a five to 10% out there that just like to eat. They're kind of like me. They're gonna just keep eating until they're full, right? They can't help themselves, right? So. But the majority of chickens eat for their energy needs and they're going to stop, you know, when they hit their calories required for the day based on temperature, living environment, all that. So that's that's a true statement. So you all can see where where rice falls in. Excuse me, wheat falls in. I like wheat. Wheat comes in at about 10 percent protein. It's a little bit higher. It's got a nice fiber. It's right on track or where I want a poultry diet to be at 5 percent. Um, the energy is good. So if you have yellow leg chickens or, you know, wheat is going to work against you. So there's no pigmenting, right? There's no help as far as coloration in the bird going to come from wheat. So the folks living up north where wheat is very prolific and easy to find or Canada, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to need other help if we need to make nice bright yellow legs and bright yellow yolks and things like that. But, all right, let's try the next slide, Karen. All right, I got one more question, and I probably should wait. But That's fine, oats, go ahead. No, would, I don't care. Would oats be on this slide? Is that an energy grain, or is that a... It is, but I put it on the fiber slide. Okay, all right. I knew I should have and, waited. Yeah, it's on here. 
Uh, it's on the fiber slide. And because the fiber level is so high and the energy is so low, I didn't really feel that it qualified as an energy grain, but it is. Okay. All right. So the typical proteins that you're going to see out here, they're in this order because I alphabetized them, not because um, this is how they're used or their level of importance. So the primary protein out there is going to be soybean meal, 48%. <clears throat> could be 48, could be 47, could be 46, depends on where you live and how it's processed. Um, it really depends on the starting protein of the soybean before they remove the oil. So <clears throat> soybean meal, let's say it's going to be 47. Typical right now, the average is 47. Um, fat levels will be three and a half or less. I've seen fat levels down at one and a half. Right. They're getting new technology, new ways to press the bean, not press, <clears throat> new ways to extract the oil where they're more efficient. Um, Fiber is going to be right around that 5%. Energy level is only at 1,020. Okay? And that's based on the 3%, 3.5 fat um, <clears throat> of the soybean meal processors that are getting it lower. That, that energy level is going to be lower as well. So I, for those of you who can see this, hopefully you can see it well. Um, I mean, I'm happy if there's questions to go through and go read them off like I did on the grain chart, but uh, on the energy chart. <clears throat> what I want you to see is that there's pretty much no energy in most of the proteins that we use. Okay. Um, what we're using these for are the proteins, but you also, if you, if you could compare we're using them for the amino acids, right? So out here, you're looking at like those soybean meals being at 2.7 <clears throat> lysine and 0.6 or 0.65 methionine. So your protein and the quality of the protein is important to achieve those right levels so that the birds can thrive. So it just depends on where you live and what they're using. Um, Again, I'm not a big fan of the corn distillers. Uh, also, will go on a label as dried distiller grains. Um, I'm not a huge fan of flax meal. Uh, while the protein's there, the fiber's high. Um, levels of flax meal above 7% of the diet can cause gizzard erosion. And you'll also start to get some off flavoring in the meat and the eggs of the bird. So if you ever think about eating the birds, which most of you won't, but... For those who choose to eat their call birds, um, <clears throat> birds fed high levels of flax are not going to be enjoyable. It's going to have kind of a paint like smell and flavor. So um, up north, you know, for the folks wanting to be soy free, peas are, are the number one choice. Uh, they're getting really expensive. They're very low in protein. So it's hard to make peas work. Um, you know, uh, Karen uses, and where I can, I like to use the roasted soybeans down at the bottom. So it's the whole soybean. It gets cooked. Um, it's got to be at a minimum of 270 degrees for 20 minutes. But the energy level's there, and the fat level is 18%. So, <clears throat> you know, when I'm using a roasted soybean, it's really easy to get my protein, get my fat, keep my energy where it needs to be, um, and balance a ration. But these are not available everywhere. So, look, if you're not in, like, a dairy country where they have a lot of milk cows, um, <clears throat> they're not as readily available across the country as I wish they were. But if you have access to them, feel yourself very fortunate because they are outstanding source of protein. So I'm going to give a plug. If you live in North Carolina, Mule City Feeds processes their own soybeans. Um, and you can get either the full fat roasted soybean meal, which is the bottom, or you can, they take that out for me by special order in the middle of the process, or that you can get the expelled meal at the end as well. So two choices. Yeah. Mule city is awesome. Everybody should live next to mule city. <laughs> <clears throat> um, so before I leave this slide, I do want to explain the different processes to the soybean because I don't think everybody understands. You see the soybean meal where it says solvent extracted. So 
they literally heat the bean, grind the bean, um, and then they add a chemical known as hexane, which is an industrial degreaser. <clears throat> okay. And they add hexane to it. They kind of roll it around and blow it around in a large chamber with forced air. <clears throat> but the hexane degreaser removes the oil from the soybean flesh and is driven off with forced air. And then it's collected um, where they separate the heck. Well, they tell us that they separate the hexane from the fat. Okay. So, or the oil of the bean. And I believe they probably get 99% of it or more. I personally don't think they can get it all. That's just my belief. Okay. I could be wrong, but um, <clears throat> I wasn't real wild about having my beans washed in hexane. So this isn't my choice. Okay. Now, some of you don't have choices and I'll make formulas with for you with soybean meal solvent extracted. Soybean meal expelled, they heat the bean, they grind the bean, and they put it into a giant screw press. It's like a, it's like a giant corkscrew inside of a sieve or a screen, and they just apply an intense amount of pressure, hydraulic pressure, and they're pressing the oil out of the soybean flesh. And then when they're done, they're still about... 7% oil remaining in the bean, but it, it, to me, it's a much more natural process. So all they did is heat, grind, screw, and then they take it out and they dry it and they sell it to the feed industry. Again, we talked about the roasted soybean. <clears throat> that is all the bean, all the oil. It's the whole bean going into the process. It just has to be cooked. So, all right. Nobody... No nope. questions on that? Yeah. Not yet. Okay. All right. So we're going on to fiber feeds. Woohoo! But I'm big on fiber. So <clears throat> I think a chicken diet needs to be between 5 and 7% diet. Or 5 to 7% of the diet. Um, 5 for chicks in immatures. And closer to 7 for matures as they get older. <clears throat> so the ingredients that I use or I like to see used are in the alfalfa meal and the alfalfa hair, basically the same thing, you know, 17 protein. Again, I'm not putting enough in there to make a difference with, with the alfalfa as far as protein goes, right? Besides most of your show feeds, breeder feeds, grower feeds, all that are going to be 18% anyway. So it's not helping the total. What I'm after here is the fiber, okay? 24% <clears throat> fiber. So I can use this to achieve those appropriate fibers. The other thing is, is the green in the alfalfa there, it's really high in um, xanthophils or carotenoids. So it helps with egg yolk color, skin color, things like that. So the folks that want white skin birds, Rip, probably want to avoid using alfalfa meal. Um, or any type of greenery. So some of that will transpose into yellow. <clears throat> right. So the key factor here, just know that I'm using alfalfa meal to, for fiber. And remember I was talking about fiber and energy. So look, fiber on the alfalfa meal is 24% fiber and the energy level is only 672. Right. Very low. Mm -hmm. uh, <clears throat> Same thing happens when I go down into like wheat middlings. Um, they do test at 15% protein. However, I can't tell you that all of that is available. Um, I think this national average fiber level is a little low at eight and a half. I think it's probably closer to 10, but this is the number we have to use unless we know otherwise. Uh, energy level at 950. I keep talking about energy. So in a starter diet, we need about 1,350 kilocalories per pound. In a grower diet, 1,300. In a layer mature bird diet, we're looking at about 1,260 to 1,280. Okay, so just to put that into relationship for you. Uh, <clears throat> wheat middlings really have a little bit, 
have very little nutritional value to them whatsoever. Um, but nobody ever has told you this before. And, you know, I, it annoys me that the feed industry uses these things. And I, they, they, I don't know. It feels like they're taking advantage of people. It looks good on paper, but it really isn't. And um, oats, 10% protein doesn't really help us out there. 4% fat doesn't really help us out there. Remember, we want a five to seven on the fat level. Fiber, you know, the really the only thing that's helping me out here is fiber, right? 10 and a half on the fiber. Um, it doesn't kill the energy like the alfalfa does. So I have about 1160 on the energy, but it's still lower than any of the energies I just described to you. So that's why I put it on the fiber page. It's beneficial fiber. Um, my two favorite fibers are alfalfa meal and oats. So they're, <clears throat> they're a denser fiber. Um, they're harder. And when they go past through the digestive tract, they're continually kind of scraping and cleaning the intestinal wall and the gut wall. So they keep the slime from building up. But when it scrapes that gut wall, it's allowing the bird to absorb more nutrients out of what it's eating. Um, so it's in there for a lot of reasons. And there's some old data that shows that oat hulls, you know, the outer skin on that oat, um, once they break apart and that once they go through the gizzard, they become like miniature swords and they're very sharp and shard like. Um, and they actually irritate internal parasites and will knock them loose and let them be defecated out. And it will reduce internal parasite populations using the right amount of oats. Now, somebody heard me just say oats will worm a chicken and tomorrow they're going to choke their chicken with a half a pound of oats and that don't work that way. Okay. You want the diet to be somewhere uh, between five and 10% of the diet. Okay. And that, that's the right level. You know, everything else has to balance, right? We got to get the energy right. We got to get the protein right, amino acids, all that. But oats are actually a wonderful chicken feed when used correctly. I, I know a lot of the old timers loved oats. They thought an awful lot of it. Yeah. I mean, you start feeding oats and all of a sudden you don't have to change anything else. You just start feeding a little bit of oats around that 5% of the diet. And because the bird's gut wall is absorbing more, getting more nutrients, the bird's going to shine up. It's going to perk up. And it's going to just, you know, it, you're going to see the difference. I mean, if you could open up the one of your chickens that hasn't ever had oats and you examine that internal, you know, the intestinal wall and the gut wall, you, it would just be coated with multicolored slime right? That's been laying there being stagnant for years. Um, and it really doesn't get a chance to clean up or purge itself. So I'm, I'm a big fan. So that's just. What you're describing is the results they were after, but I don't think they were using it, thinking of it in that term. No, no, they would, you know, they just, they fed some oats and they really liked what they saw. So they fed a little bit more right. and they, they kept feeding more until the chicken left it in the pan, right? And then they realized they went too far. And too much oats is just as bad. The bird will starve to death, you know, if you feed too many oats, right? There's not enough energy. You know, you're going to start losing breast. You're going to start losing, you know, condition and tone. You're going to... So, you know, all things in moderation. And, <clears throat> yeah. You're not going to do the last slide? No, I am. Okay. I thought you were just, I thought you were kicking me out. I'm like, okay. You guys you were having a conversation. I decided that uh, they wanted to see your beautiful faces. He was kicking me out. Okay. Oh, yeah. Last slide. <laughs> Last slide. And this is all, you know, you can bug me or Rip if you want a copy of the presentation. It's going to be out there in the YouTube video forever and ever and ever. Um, so help yourself. Some of the specialty products, depending on where you live, uh, Camelina meal, another oil seed. Um, good protein, limited FDA says, USDA says we can only feed 10% of the diet of camelina meal. It's only really in the Pacific Northwest, limited quantities. 
you've all heard me talk about fish meal. I'm a big fan of fish meal. If you look out there at the lysine and methionine, you're going to see why. Um, it's not just about the protein. <clears throat> it's about the amino acids. It's about, you know, fulfilling the craving that a chicken has for a meat type protein. There is no vegetarian chicken. So if somebody tells you they got a vegetarian chicken, they are either crazy or lying to you. So there is absolutely never, ever going to be a vegetarian chicken, right? But if it's but, in a cage and you can make sure that it's never eaten an insect. Yeah. yeah, even then, you know, did it eat a feather? You know, <laughs> did it get a bug flying by? Who knows? I mean, they're just not, yeah, they're not meant to be vegetarians. So they do need a little bit of meat protein in their diet. Um, oil, any type of cooking oil, it says vegetable because that's a generic term, but pretty much any oil, um, if you have to use the soybean meal or your diet is low in fat, you know, oil is great, really high energy. That's really all it's bringing to the, to the diet is energy and oil. Um, we're getting a little bit of sesame meal in the Southeast region. Uh, there's some other small pockets, uh, after they, you know, again, it's oil seed production. They're pressing out the oil so we can all have sesame oil, sesame seed oil. For cooking and other things um <clears throat> and i put black oil sunflower seeds and i know somebody's going to be annoyed with me by putting it here but fiber levels are 31 percent okay fat levels are 27 percent and the protein on and this is actually i'm lying here it's not 18 this is old data uh the new information on black oil sunflower seeds is showing 16 to 17 percent protein uh, <clears throat> the energy values that I see are all over the place. So, you know, my older information says 1200. I've seen some newer stuff saying closer to 2000. They're not cost effective. Um, I put them on here so you can see they really don't add anything to a diet. Okay. So <clears throat> I'm not saying don't feed them. I'm just saying don't get carried away with feeding them. Um, you know, there's, there's not a lot of benefit to it. You know, yeah, they're going to get the oils out of there. So if you're not feeding oils otherwhere, otherwise to get fat, then <clears throat> you may need something like a black oil sunflower seed to get the fat levels where you want them, but just don't get carried away. So, all right. I've stepped on yeah. enough toes. That's the end of my presentation. Well, Go ahead, Riff. Uh, I just would like for you to touch on the difference between, uh, Fish, the fish meals out there that are more commonly used, the Menhaden meal and the catfish meal. Yeah. And, and you know, where Rip lives and, and in his past life, he would be most familiar with. So the catfish meal is um, there's catfish farms across the south. Right. If you drive across to Alabama, Mississippi, Louisiana, there's a lot of catfish farming going on down there. It's a big commercial industry. So. Once they take the, the part they want, the fillets off the side, um, pretty much everything that's left, right? You know, uh, lips and tails and, and entrails, et cetera, all goes into a big tub, gets ground, gets turned into. Now, that protein is only going to be 50, 55. Okay? It's not as high a protein. Um, the protein that I used here was actually sardine meal. Um, this is wild caught you know, coming out of the Pacific Ocean. But the most common in the U.S., because it's run by two large industries or two large companies, uh, Omega Protein and Daybrook Fisheries, is Menhaden, also known as Bunker. And it is harvested for the oil, uh, again, and to be turned into protein, but they have a market for the oil as well. So they catch it, Gulf of Mexico, Eastern seaboard, pretty much all the way from Maine to the tip of Florida and around the corner. Um, the reason I've, I've shied away from the Menhaden is there's no regulations or restrictions on how much they can harvest. So <clears throat> on the years where they find the schools, they can harvest. They just, they tend to over harvest. They're going to take all that they want. Right. There's no nobody saying, hey, stop. You can only have so much. Right. There's no controls and so on. Um, 
<clears throat> so I've shifted from, I have nothing against it. It's a good protein source. So if that's what you have, that's what you have. And I'm saying, I'm not saying for you not to use it. What I'm saying is I shifted away and I've contracted um, with a small fishery in, in Mexico and they are governed. Um, there's only so many tons of sardine that is legally allowed to be harvested. And that number is actually set by Peru each year based on scientific studies and data. Um, they got, they got teams of marine biologists go out, you know, they count and collect schools and they can see them now by uh, satellite and based on like six months worth out of the year of data collection, they establish a harvest limit. And um, that's what everybody down there has to live by. So they, they're, they're protecting it. They're taking care of it. <clears throat> so I've shifted to a sardine meal. That's about 62% protein. There's others out there. There's, you know, there's herring meals. There's all kinds of stuff. And I wanted to just put, we talked about, and you said it during each time, like a value that you're aiming at. And it's going to be different for each level of growth and stage. But I wanted to put something on the screen yep. from a previous one for people to see the numbers <laughs> for a little yep. bit that they can pause on. So that's why. I yeah. Asked. You know, ME, ME poultry is the metabolized energy halfway down and measured in kilocalories per pound. It's just abbreviations that nutritionists like myself use. These are the recognized, I mean, most of them you can understand, protein, fat, fiber, calcium, phosphorus, salt, sodium. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I didn't really even need you to discuss them. Literally, I just wanted to be able to put them on the screen in case right. they didn't catch yep. him. <laughs> yep. As a reference, I got it. Yep. Yep. As your conversation. All okay. right, you ready for some questions? Sure. i fast track these. All right, so. <laughs> fast track right. bedtime, right? No, that's true. <laughs> Anthony, no, I got a whole hour till bedtime. Um, Anthony that's wants to know how high no. on the descending list of ingredients does alfalfa meal need to be in a feed? How high? So it should be at five percent. It's probably going to be item five, four, five, or six. Okay, it depends on how many other ingredients are in there, but. It's going to be item four, five, or six is where I would expect to see alfalfa meal on the list. So if they're using multiple grains, let's say they use corn, milo, wheat, and then they're going to have their protein next, hopefully, and no byproducts, then it's going to be alfalfa meal. It's going to come in. If it's just corn and soy, alfalfa meal could come in at four. But yeah, so somewhere around four, five, or six. It should always be ahead of all the vitamins and the minerals, you know. Now, it won't be on a layer feed because your calcium is going to be 150 to 200 pounds per ton. So on a layer feed, your calcium is going to come in there at usually around four or five, and your alfalfa meal should be right behind it. So. I, I especially want to put this up because I had a question about alfalfa meal. Earlier, you sort of said that the meals were always the least effective, like, byproducts of something else. Is that true of alfalfa meal and, like, kelp meal? or? No. Great question. So alfalfa meal is actually harvested for animal feed. Right? It's 100% of the plant. Nothing's been removed. So they fresh harvest it. They take it to a large dehydrator. Um, get the moisture off it as quick as they can. And, you know, then they turn it into pellets, move it around the world, wherever they want to go with it. And then it gets reground and turned back into meal. Um, so in this one case, that yeah. actually is literally just describing the form yeah. so, that it comes in. Well, there's others too. So like kelp meal, like you talked about, you know, there's, there's others that are dehydrated and ground for that purpose. Um, but when it comes to the proteins, it's always oil seeds that have had the oils removed because we tend to find that the oil seeds, um, once you remove their, most of them are out of the legume family, right? So <clears throat> once you remove the oil, the protein levels get significantly higher and they, they're, they figured out how to use them in animal feeds, whether they're good, bad or otherwise. All right. 
I'm going to combine two into this. So just listen to what I say. Don't read it. So um, Benita said, before you talked about black oil sunflower seeds, she feeds them with shell on. Would it be better if she fed them with shell off? <laughs> but again, yeah. this was before you said that you yeah. didn't really care if people did it right. one way or another. So. so, yeah, so they would be a little bit better if they were sunflower seed hearts and the hull was removed. Because that would lower uh, the fiber, right? Yeah. I just don't, you know, I mean, it's great. It's a treat. So now your fat level is going to get crazy high, right? So you, you just don't want to get carried away. Um, you know, yeah, the protein went up, but the, the fat's going to nearly double, okay? Or it is it is going to double. So it's going to go from, what, 27 to 55, um, just like that. <clears throat> and too much fat is a bad thing. So remember, fat total fat levels between five and seven, right? And every now and then we can go to eight, but good fat levels are five to seven. All right. Um, all right. North Star Farm wants to know about how the heat affects the nutrients. I think we were talking about the soybean process at this point, um, but yeah, I mean, <clears throat> probably you know. So actually legumes need to be heated in order for their uh, urease or trypsin inhibitor to be broken down, which is an enzyme in there. <clears throat> so heat is required for most legumes to be more effectively digested. Now, as we all know, uh, when we cook things and we overcook things, that a lot of the other nutrients are no longer available or able to be absorbed. So there's an art to roasting a soybean um, <clears throat> or any other grain, you know, to hit it at just the right spot. So I, I don't want people out back, you know, flipping soybeans on their barbecue grill later tonight, trying to get them 270 for 20 minutes. That's it. It's a whole science and an art and probably videos on YouTube because you can see anything on YouTube, but um, yeah. Or evidence, yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, but a lot of the vitamins are lost. Uh, so we don't count really any vitamins, you know, in the soybeans. Um, you know, some of the micronutrients are going to be tied up and bound after the heating process. That's a true statement. But hey, we see the same thing with pelleted feeds and people keep feeding pelleted feeds. So, you know, it's weirdos. Necessary all, evils, I all, guess. All weirdos. All right. Yeah. So this is a quick replacement question. Okay. Do you use loose chopped alfalfa like fed to rabbits instead of meal or yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I don't I don't really care what form the alfalfa is in. You know, I, I, actually if you if you really love your chickens, right? You really love your chickens, you're gonna build a wire cage with two inch by four inch wire. So it holds a flake of alfalfa and you're going to go buy baled, you know, alfalfa hay, put it in there and let them harvest it out of that hanger, out of that homemade basket. And they're just going to be the happiest chickens ever. They get to destroy something. They get to tear it apart with their beaks and they get something green all at the same time. All right. I'm pairing these days. for a long time too. I'm What's pairing... that? I said, it'll keep them entertained for a good while too. Oh, long time yeah it should be in there all the time i'm combining a thank you with the next question so beverly wants to thank you for discussing regional variations and the value of sourcing what is locally available um and it's then the important. Next, yeah the next question is how would you choose the right ingredients for the type of fowl you have so if you were building i think i actually sorry he asked it better down here so if you're making your own feed how do you choose the right ingredients to hit all the way. Uh, <laughs> not an easy, not an easy answer to that. Really, you just start out with what every what what is available. What what can we get? Okay, in your region, then we fill in the blanks and we do the best we can with what you have locally available. Um, but I, you know, I wish more people would make their own feed. It, it's amazing stuff and definitely outperforms stuff that comes off of the shelf at, at any local farm supply store. 
but you know, it's more time, it's more energy, you know, I, yeah. but yeah. yeah, you know, Victor wants to reach out to me, you know, first off you find out what can we get, right? And, you know, there's, there's generic feed formulas. I think there's some on the PK group. Is there some on the yeah. PK 360 group and there's some mm -hmm. on the breeder, poultry breeder nutrition group. There's just, you know, rations as ideas to get you started and get you thinking and, and so on. And, you know, we can work from those, we can build around them. You know, it's not an easy question, Victor, because I've made chicken feeds with stuff you wouldn't even believe a chicken would eat. So there's a lot of possibilities and opportunities out there. All right. So Kathy wants to know what's meant by the terms nutritionally available and essentially non-available. Um, I'm not sure. I think you said that about some. Oh, of the during the heating process. Yeah. So like on the soybeans, mm -hmm. you know, certain nutrients are just not going to be, you know, they're, they're no longer, so they're going to be bound up or they're going to be converted in their form, their molecular form depending on the heat level, right? So the higher the heat goes, the more that gets bound. Um, and they're just no longer going to be digestible in a digestive tract of a chicken or a pig or something like that. So something's always lost. Anytime we cook something, we're losing something, right? Uh, it's always going to happen. Well, Mike, you talked about it too uh, during the... Uh, uh, the animal proteins that the yeah. animal protein was easier or more nutritionally available to the to the chicken than than a plant protein was yeah it is it's just the way the proteins are actually put together with those with those uh higher lysine higher methionine levels the protein molecule is going to be more readily available or readily digestible <clears throat> okay um all right, so here's two questions on individual ingredients. What do you think about popcorn? <laughs> it's corn. It, it's, it's really no different. I mean, you know, nutritionally, it, it's a little bit. It's like instead of 8% protein, it's going to be 9% protein. Um, instead of 1540 on energy, it's going to be like 1450, 1500. It's pretty much just corn's corn. And I don't care whether you call it popcorn, maize, you know. Is it have flowery. less nutrition after you pop it? Uh, yeah. Yeah, it does. All right. And you did a little bit about peanut meal, but I think that is used in, would you say, Texas? Yeah. You know, I mean, across the southern states, Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, um, anywhere that they grow peanuts and then they crush it to get the oil out of it, <clears throat> um, there's going to be peanut meal available. You know, and, and the good peanut meal that's fit for actual animal feed um, is getting bought up by the Purdue's, the Pilgrim Prides, the Tysons, you know, they're all buying it up. So there's not a whole lot that actually hits the market to make, you know, smaller producer type feeds. But occasionally, you know, I can get a little bit, you know, I do some formulations in Texas. There's some out there. So. All right, we're going to make this the last question because we're way over and Rip does get angry at us. No, um, I, why do you say that? I do not. I know. It's fun to make him look I bad, know. though. I he's the chaperone. Sure. Since he's the oldest of the group, he's got to be the chaperone, right? All right, Jeff, but you have to read oh, this boy. first part when you respond. My young sons are watching and want to know about the hype around mealworms. So <laughs> be gentle. Yeah. Okay. All right. So... Yeah, look, you know, mealworms, high fat, high carbohydrate, um, good protein levels. I, I don't know that there is a hype around mealworms. It kind of comes and goes. I have nothing against mealworms. Um, if you want to grow them and you want to make them as part of your, you know, poultry diet, yeah, that's fine. And actually, for your young sons, I think it's a great project for them to grow the mealworms. Um, just be careful how much you give. I mean... A couple of two, three mealworms per chicken per day is plenty. Um, use them again like a treat. And, you know, on larger scale, it's not necessarily cost effective to raise the mealworms. <clears throat> Here's the thing. Most people feed their mealworms chicken feed to raise the mealworm. 
So all you're doing is pre-digesting and converting chicken feed into another form of chicken feed when it's all said and done. And I'm going to leave it at that. I, I will add one thing about mealworms. If you are trying to coop train your birds or, or train them in any way, there is nothing that will get a bird's attention and get them to to toe the line any faster than offering a, a fresh wiggling mealworm between your fingers. <laughs> I can believe that. that you will be their best buddy. Um, Jeff, you did have that slide about the meat and insect proteins. Do you mind if I throw that up real quick? Oh, go ahead. No. Did we miss it? I thought I had that. It, it was on oh. the previous in previous kind. So, yeah. but this one just had the black soldier fly and the crickets okay. and the mealworm. Yeah. So, yeah. So those are dried, of course, you know, and I put those over in the, I should have called them exotic proteins <laughs> um, because of their cost. You know, it'd yeah. be like driving a Lamborghini for some of us. Um, you know, good energy levels, good protein levels. These are the dried forms. Now, these are not alive and wiggling. Those numbers are half because they're about half moisture. So you cut all those numbers in half, roughly. <clears throat> um, if you want to sit down and work on your own chicken feed. So uh, on the other side, you can see you like where meat and bone meal, catfish meal, you know, how those different uh, meat proteins come together. So, um, yeah, that's. That's all. You know, but all of these proteins on this slide <clears throat> cost a little bit more than plant-based proteins. Right. So. so pick one and try to get it into your chicken's diet, but right. don't make it the main protein source. No. All right. Okay. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Or I you think can... we're... Uh, oh, hold on. We could pull this up. Jeff loves mycotoxins. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh huh. All right. So, they're a thing, they're getting bigger, and you can test for them, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, they're, it depends on the growing season. <clears throat> but yeah, microtoxins are spreading across our entire world feed and food supply. Um, they're out there. I blame it on our new farming techniques, um, but that's a whole other subject. You know, um, look, I mean, it's hard. They're hard to test for. They're, it's not cheap to test for them. Uh, I, I would love to see people testing for them. Um, but, you know, you're looking at at least 25 bucks, and that's for the quick test. Um, the more expensive tests are up in the $80 per test range. So you, you're only going to do that a few times. Look, so at two parts per million, <clears throat> two parts per million, right? Um, there's, you're going to start to see a, a little bit looser manure, a little bit less. So the birds are going to look a little bit dull, right? Not as shiny, not as, not as thrifty, not maybe not as energetic. Um, at five, parts per million, you're really going to start to see a change in the manure viscosity. Um, you know, the, their appetites are going to go down. You're going to start to see feed left over where you wouldn't have seen feed left over before. Um, you know, their bellies are going to start hurting. You're going to start seeing them eat like dirt. If your birds are out free ranging and they have access to it, they're going to start eating strange things. Uh, they'll eat bedding, they'll eat dirt, they'll eat, um, you know, and that's just trying to soothe that. So think about food poisoning. A any of you that have ever had food poisoning in your life, right? You, you ate something you shouldn't have eaten, and all of a sudden your guts just get totally disruptive. And, <clears throat> you know, um, out here, because we live close to Hershey, we call it the Hershey squirts, but, you know... Um, you know, diarrhea, painful diarrhea, you know, stomach cramps. That's what your bird's going through, right? That's what mycotoxins are doing to the inside of your chicken. So the higher it gets, the worse it gets. Um, pretty soon they quit eating. You know, when you start getting up above 7 to 10, 
you know, they're, they're going to pick and choose. You'll see feed sorting. If you're not feeding pellets, um, I've seen birds kick corn out on the ground, right? They're, you never see a chicken waste a piece of corn. They, there was piles and pounds of corn laying on the ground, you know, and we tested it and, uh, yeah, sure enough, you know, just high, high. And that was at five and six parts per million. They started, these are, these are the lesser intelligent Cornish crossbirds actually that I'm referring to. So, you know, they were made to eat and they were wasting corn. Um, so yeah, you just gradually see, and it's a problem is, is it's gradual. It's not night and day. So you don't see a big change. You know, they just gradually don't clean up their feeders. Um, you see more feed wasted, things like that. Uh, they, they lose their shine. They look, lose the brightness in their eye. Manure gets strange. This is all gradual over two, three, four weeks. So it's hard to identify, but it, it's definitely becoming a problem. Okay. Um, I, now there's a lot more questions that are difficult. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm trying to decide whether we sign off. Rip, why don't you decide? Well, let's, we do have a special announcement tonight. Okay, let's do that. Um, okay. I, I alluded to that in my post today, and I'm... Uh, didn't mean to not give you a, a, at least a little hint, but I thought a, a good tease might uh, help get a few more folks here tonight. It looks like it worked. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is the year 2023, and that's a special uh, special year for the poultry folks. Um, some of you are familiar with the Ohio National Poultry Show, um, and it occurs. Um, I believe it's the first weekend or second week, I'm not sure now, uh, in November. But this year is the 150th anniversary of the American Poultry Association, and the big blowout celebration is going to be three days of, uh, of it. It's going to be November 10th and 12th in uh, Columbus, Ohio. It is the place to be. They're anticipating in excess of 10,000 birds entered in the show and over 700 uh, exhibitors there. Uh, there will be breeds there that will be shown that you will probably never ever see at most any other poultry show. Uh, I know they always have a huge, I mean a huge for sale area uh, of sale birds that you can buy to take home. Um, anything from bantams to turkeys and big geeses and it, it, Melissa says it's a poultry palooza, and it very much so is, uh, as Festus Hagen would have said, a pearl bangle button billy. Uh, but that's really not the special announcement. The special announcement is that all three of us, uh, Jeff and Karen and myself, will be there. Uh, we'll be there with a booth, stop by and say hello. Uh, Karen will sign autographs for, I think you said, what, $10 or something like that, was it? I said, no. I will not even sit behind that table. I will yes, stand. Yes, you will. Next yeah. We're going to nail your feet to the floor. Um, but please, if you go, stop by and say hello. We would love to meet you all. Um, Guess who else is going to be there? Uh, Craig Hansen is going to be there. Craig Hansen does not miss Ohio National. And um, that, that will be a treat just getting to, to, to visit with Craig for a while. Uh, come hang out with us. Stop by. Uh, we'll be right next to the fur trail booth, uh, or fur trail will be right next to us, no matter how with one way or the other. Uh, but please do, if you're at the Ohio National, stop by and say hello. Uh, we don't get out and about to shows very often as a group, any, uh, just because we are kind of scattered all over the United States. But uh, this is a chance to, to do it, and we're going to do it. I feel so, like somebody has to say, God willing, the creek don't rise. <laughs> it, no, it's a good Lord willing and creek don't rise. Uh, but um, with that said, um, I appreciate everybody tuning in and, and joining us for the, the show tonight. We had a lot of fun. Uh, I hope you learned a lot. I, I know I picked up a, a couple of new things here. I always do when I, I get to listen to my buddy Jeff. Um, so... 
Thank you very much. And until next time, keep enjoying your birds. We'll see you later. Bye-bye, y'all.